Hey everyone, welcome back to my Halloween edition reviews. Uh, tomorrow I start uh, talking about the Halloween films, so uh, for those interested, check them out. Uh, I'll be doing them day, pretty much one after another. Uh, I'm trying to decide though if I should go the one I like the least to my favorite one. Or if I should just do it in order. But I am not reviewing Halloween 2 because I reviewed that in 2011 uh, for my last Halloween edition reviews. But as you can read from the title, I am talking about a TV show. Um, I grew up watching this TV show. And I always... Uh, found it to be really cool and interesting and most of the only problem I ever really had with each of the episodes the endings like they call them Tales from the Crypt endings uh, if you've ever heard that uh, phrase before it pretty much means it ends in a negative way uh, now, a couple episodes do end in a positive way, but I am talking about my favorite season, season six. Uh, I got this from a friend. She bought it for my birthday last year, and what can I say? It's, it's a great set. Uh, even though there are two cases, it's three discs. Uh, you've got special appearances by Hank Azaria, Shelly Hack, who I don't know who she is, Isaac Hayes, rest in peace, man, um, Richard Lewis, don't know who he is, John Lithgow, uh, Wayne Newton, I do know who those people are, Isabella Rosalini, I, I know a little bit about her, Rita Redner, don't know. And Humphrey Bogart, I definitely know who he is. Um, and what is Tales from the Crypt? For those who don't know, these came out in the 50s, but these are reissues. Tales from the Crypt presents The Haunt of Fear. Uh, this one, uh, each issue had their own hosts. Uh, like, for Tales from the Crypt, it was the Crypt Keeper. Ah, sorry about that. My screensaver popped up again. There's the Crypt Keeper. Yeah, he doesn't look anything like he does in the show. Then we've got the Vault Keeper, who does the Vault of Horror. And then Haunt of Fear is uh, said by the Witch. Now, I'll show you a little bit of artwork that went into these books. For their time, they were pretty damn controversial. The 50s. Huh, you gotta love it. Um, and by today's standards, they're like, oh, oh, oh those aren't controversial anymore. Well, what do you expect, man? In the 50s, from what I'm told, uh, it was all about, kind of like the 60s, if you think about it, all about uh, peace and love. And it was when, I know about the 50s, mostly about Elvis. Uh, and yeah, I like Elvis Presley. So... I'm trying to find a good enough picture here. There is several stories to keep you busy. Like, if you're waiting in line or whatever, uh, well, sitting down at a lunch table, eating lunch, read some of these stories. I would love to have this as a poster. Besides the text right there, just have it be uh, the Crypt Keeper, and it's saying this little piggy. Now, each of the 
uh, hosts have their own setting. Uh, Crypt Keeper had the Crypt of Terror. Uh, the Vault Keeper had the Vault of Horror, which is also the name of the issue. And the Old Witch had the Witch's Cauldron. And, well, I guess I won't talk about the issues for another couple of minutes. But, are they worth picking up? It it depends on what you're into, because the episodes do follow some of the stories, but the stories in the show are a little bit more gorier and a little bit more sexual, because there's, there's some nudity in some of these episodes. Um... Uh, I watched every episode on this disc to m on this season to make sure everything worked properly, and I might as well show what the cases look like. Uh, they're the thin cases and they're see-through, just like uh, the box, dust cover, whatever you want to call it, and. There's what we got. And believe it or not, that is Felicio del Toro. I hope I pronounced his name right. Mm. Okay, let's get into reviewing. I'm going to review each of the episodes. But I'm not going to rate them. No. Uh, let the punishment fit the crime. Um, this one has... Catherine O'Hara, most people remember her from stuff like Orange County, uh, Home Alone. Um, she's played in some other stuff too. But I love this season, but anyways, back to the episode. She plays a lawyer who sues small businesses like, um, uh, she pretty much takes the side of the person who's in an accident and sues the company or whatever. And she, and she uh, went ahead. Well, she, the she's she's a lawyer, not not a person. Well, a lawyer is a person, but you know what I mean. Uh, if somebody is going to sue just a small company. Uh, Catherine O'Hara is pretty much the lawyer to call uh, because she'll help you win the case. But she ends up getting, a, I think it's a flat tire, and what happens is she lands in a little city called Stixville, uh, which is pronounced Stooks, but it's pronounced Stixville. Um, and anyways... All the characters, other than Catherine O'Hara, are, like, really kind of quiet, uh, they don't talk much, of course, that's what quiet means, duh, uh, they, they seem really... I have seen a lot of strange stuff, but they act kind of strange. And I'm strange sometimes, too, but this is just on a whole another level of strange. Anyways, she is being put on trial for pretty much just having, you know how... With license plates, you have to have six uh, characters. Well, hers only has five, but she counts the space. And here's what her uh, here's what her license plate says. Sue for you or something like that. Um. Uh, like Sue, then the number four, and then you. 
So that would be five characters. But if you count the space, it would be six. Six. And I find that kind of weird. Not weird as in uh, the license plate thing, but why on earth would you be put on trial for that simple reason like i mean i could understand if a cop stops you and says oh uh your license plate it's not valid because it doesn't have six characters and at that moment i'd go pretty much right to jail because i'd be like I got this goddamn car from a friend. He gave it to me. Well, actually, I bought it off of him and everything, but what's this big deal about a license plate, huh? I did nothing wrong. Do I have drugs in the trunk? No. Do I have alcohol in, sitting on my lap right here? No. Oh, wait, I do have an alcohol. <laughs> uh, but... I thought this episode was pretty fun, but what happens is, um, the city of Stooksville, I keep on wanting to say Stooksville because of the way it's spelled, but Stooksville, um, uh, she is just about to be found guilty, and she has a lawyer of her own, uh, somebody from Sticksville, or so you think, uh, he ends up helping her out, and this is a kind of odd, gangly little, little fellow, not like little as in three foot or anything, but like, he's skinny, odd and very gangly, and he is helping her, uh, not be put on trial anymore, like, to be found not guilty and he comes in just at the right time when uh, the judge is about to say guilty uh, but it doesn't go over so well because the judge pretty much says uh, you will go you are allowed to go home and here's I'm skipping through some stuff because I want people to see the whole episode, but in order for her to go back home, she has to do a little bit of community service, and the community service is pretty damn cool what happens. I'll show you the back of the box. That's from Let the Punishment Fit the Crime. Uh... It's cool what happens, but is it watchable, is it not watchable, is it horrible, is it fantastic? It's not fantastic, but it is a great episode, like, it's a great way to start off the season, uh, and I would say... Definitely worth a watch, yeah. And I don't know why I put it back in the box. Then when we get to episode two, now we're getting into the fucked up stuff. Only skin deep. Um, this episode is very it. It really makes my skin crawl a little bit because. This one has a lesson. Well, each episode has its own lesson. Uh, the lesson here is be careful who you pick up at a party because you don't know who they are or what they're going to do to you. So be careful. Anyways, it's about this asshole. You're, you're waiting for something to happen to him. Uh, he ends up pretty much trying to get back with his ex-girlfriend or whatever they were uh, but she doesn't want him back and it's entirely understandable because this guy sounds like a total douchebag and he looks like a total douchebag too uh, I know 
I myself might look like a douchebag a little bit. <laughs> but, anyways, this is a grade A douchebag. Uh, and he ends up meeting this really hot, attractive, beautiful woman. And she's wearing, like, a, a skin mask. Kind of like what Leatherface wears, except for it's a woman mask. Uh, and what happens is, uh, the guy decides, oh, I'm going to hit on this uh, woman. And she's not interested at all, at first. And slowly but surely, she invites him to come over to her apartment. And... He, he being an asshole, uh, ends up saying, Oh, I think I'm in love with you after they've had sex. And I'm like, You've only known this person for, what, maybe an hour, three hours at most? And you're in love? Get out of here, man. Um... Here's how I know if I'm in love. When a friendship has lasted three, four years, that's how you know because it just happens. Uh, you've known each, each other for this certain period of time. But it's, in my opinion, it's got to be at least more than two years because that's when you, you'll really know if you love this person. But anyways, back on topic. Uh, this does have some gore in it, so yay for the gore hounds. Um, it. Sorry, I'm trying to wet my mouth a little bit. Uh, dry mouth never fails. Um. Uh, Anyways, the guy, after they've had sex, uh, he tries finding out who is this woman, who is this dream girl. And before they have sex, uh, the woman says, hey, let's keep our masks on while we do it. And so they keep their masks on. And... I think she ends up saying, uh, promise me, uh, you won't ask me any personal information. And promise me to keep your mask on. And the asshole promises, but doesn't follow through with it because he ends up asking personal questions. He takes off his mask, which is pretty much like a Phantom of the Opera type of mask, you know, it's around just the eye, right eye, left eye, whatever. Um, and this pisses off the woman, and she decides to go back to sleep. Uh, and so he starts snooping around, trying to figure out who is this woman. Uh, is she really a she? Is is it a him? Is it a her? Uh, and you find out that it is a woman, but the secret is really skin deep, which is why this episode is called Only Skin Deep. And as they say, beauty is only skin deep. But I love what happens to this prick. And you will too. See the episode. Go out, pick it up. Uh, I think you can get this season for like 10 bucks down at Walmart. Uh, or you can order it online if you want. If you don't feel like going out to the store. Your business. But now we get to episode 3. Whirlpool. I used to have uh, the issue of... The Vault of Horror that had this uh, 
story in it. It's it's a little bit different, but thankfully they put a digital version, animated version of the comic book version of the story. This one has a woman by the name of Rita Rudner and Richard Lewis, pretty much only two people play in this episode, but you've got extras, so it feels more like a episode episode. It's about this woman. She's incredibly nice, but uh, she works at EC Comics, which is, as you can see here, the brand that makes the Tales from the Crypt uh, comic books. And I'm like, here we go with a little bit of self-referential stuff. And I'm just like, okay. And uh, we get her boss. He... He makes the prick in the second episode seem like a gentleman. This guy annoyed the crap out of me. I was like, Ugh, I hope she gives him a good punch right in the mouth. Knock his fucking teeth out. Yeah, I know, I might sound violent, but pro I promise people. I promise you people, I am not a violent person. Um, anyways... She, pretty much the point of this story is she's trying to find that one good story uh, she can put in uh, Tales from the Crypt issue. And they reference other stories, uh, and I actually have one of the issues uh, with the story they're talking about. Um, she's a vampire, he's a werewolf, they fall in love, and I'm like, I've got that issue. Nice. Giving a little nod to one of their best stories. Hmm. So, anyways. Uh, she decides, oh, uh, you know what? Oh, and I should go backwards here. Uh, her boss fires her for no good reason. All simply because she can't find the right story to put in the book. So, she gets fired, and it doesn't go over too well. Uh, she ends up going right up to her boss at night after she's went on a drinking binge. Points a gun right at, his, uh, at her boss, and is like, begging for her job back pretty much and saying why don't you respect me uh why this and why that and i'm like mm, i feel sorry for you woman but you're about ready to do something you'll regret and bam she shoots him and then here's what's called a whirlpool she keeps on repeating that same day over and over and over again. But there's a twist at the end. Which I find to be very cool. Which I am not going to spoil the ending. Because I think it is a phenomenal ending. And it uh, it's not a negative ending. So we get our first episode that doesn't have a negative ending. Now we get to... Not really my least favorite, but not one I see myself watching a whole lot of times. Like, I'll watch it, but the title is Operation Friendship. Uh, this one has an actor I am real familiar with, Peter Dobson. Uh, he played in the movie... The Frighteners, if anybody's seen that movie, you know it is a classic. I'll actually, if I can find it. 
I'll pull it out real fast. Ah, I can't find it. So, anyways, he plays in the Frighteners. He plays the guy who gets, uh, he's the exercise fanatic in the Frighteners who gets his heart, uh, not ripped out, but squeezed while he's on his running machine. Uh, but anyways, in this particular story, we've got... A computer programmer who's incredibly nice to people, just trying to live day to day, and this new girl ends up working uh, in the building he's working at, and they just start talking and everything, and he's got a secret. He's got an imaginary friend. And I'm just like, hmm, you are howled and you've got an imaginary friend. And the imaginary friend is Peter Dobson. So, um, I think, uh, the imaginary friend's name is Eddie. So, anyways, Eddie, uh, feels jealous because this girl is pretty much taking his only friend away, the computer programmer. And he tries to persuade uh, his friend to kill the woman. That way uh, there is nobody trying to take a uh, him away from Eddie. So, he tries to suffocate the new love of his life, but then decides not to, and ends up running away, and Eddie tries to manipulate, I wish I remembered his name, uh, Eddie tr tries to manipulate the poor guy into going on this one trip to kill this woman but slowly but surely uh the guy ends up going completely insane and i'm not spoiling anything you can literally see where this one is headed so he slowly goes cuckoo Cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, which that's actually making me hungry right now. Uh, anyways, what happens? Mm, Eddie and uh, his friend uh, start getting into a huge argument. Oh, you did this, you did that. Oh, I didn't do that. I did. I didn't do this. And I'm just like, okay, kind of odd episode. That That's why I don't watch it too much, because I think it's a really odd episode. And, again, we've got a negative ending. Okay, now on to episode five, Revenge is the Nuts. I used to have the issue that had this story in it, but I wish I knew what happened to that issue. Uh, this one has Isaac Hayes. Most people know him as playing Shaft. I hope I pronounced the name right, even though it's a weird name to begin with. Shaft. Sounds like Shaft, Shaquille O'Neal. But anyways, Isaac Hayes, who plays Chef in South Park, he is dearly missed. 
uh, by me and by many people out there. Uh, sadly, Isaac Hayes is no longer with us. Uh, but he's up in heaven right now. Just chilling and relaxing. But anyways, Revenge of the Nuts is about an insane asylum. Well, not really an insane asylum, more of a retirement home for uh, blind uh, senior citizens. And Isaac Hayes is one of the blind people in this insane asylum. And there's this new girl working uh, in the asylum. I keep on wanting to say asylum, retirement home. Uh, sh it's her first day, and she discovers the owner of the place is a complete and utter asshole to uh, the the members of this retirement home, and she decides she's going to defend them, and. The boss or owner has this nice, sweet brother who's the night guard at the retirement home. And pretty much, she's pretty, she's, she's nice, she's trying to help out, but because of her looks... She gets flirted uh, on by the big man of uh, the retirement home. And he keeps on making sexual gestures at her and pretty much sexually harasses her. And it's sad because she's blind too. So she she can't see a damn thing. She can't see what this guy looks like but all she knows is he's a perv and so the I'm just gonna call them inmates inmates of the retirement home are putting together a plan with uh, this new girl and the night guard helps out and they decide we're going to kill this bastard. And so, this one night, they have it all planned out. And, this one has a happy ending. Woo! Our second episode with a happy ending. Well, if you want to count only Skin Deep as having a happy ending. And Whirlpool as having a happy ending. So, that's our fourth episode that has a happy ending. Well, third episode. Uh, the Bribe. This one I just hated. Huh. <sighs> I never thought I'd hate, a Tales from the Crypt episode, but I hate this one. Uh, Benicio Del Toro, uh, plays an owner of this strip club where the chief... Uh, the fire, uh, the fire department, uh, owner has a daughter who pretty much worked there, and he's like, oh, this is giving my daughter a negative image. So, he starts talking to Benicio Del Toro about this, and he's all like, Oh, I promise uh, she won't work here again, so uh, we'll keep an eye out not to let her uh, work here anymore. And she had a boyfriend who pretty much mistreated her for working at the strip club. Uh, and I'm like, I really feel for this girl, and I really feel sorry for her father, too. Uh, and this one doesn't have any monsters in it. It doesn't have any cool plotline. Other than the police 
not police chief, the fire department chief uh, doesn't want his daughter working at a strip club. That's pretty much the main point of the story. And a fire ends up breaking out in the strip club and uh, not a whole lot of people make it out alive. But Benicio Del Toro does. But going backwards a couple of scenes, uh, the father ends up giving his daughter a little uh, bracelet. And he ends up seeing uh, the bracelet fall from the debris and he kills himself. But then there's this bad twist. And this what makes this is what makes me hate the episode. I'm just gonna spoil it. The daughter is dating Benicio del Toro and uh before the fire happens, she leaves her bracelet there and doesn't care anything about her dad. Uh and just waltzes into a car with Benicio Del Toro. And that's the end of the episode. You don't realize that... We realize, but... This girl doesn't even realize her father is dead. So, it's, it's not an entertaining episode whatsoever. So that clears out disc one. I'll show off the disc. I think it's a cool disc. And there's the picture. Now we get to disc two. Disc dos. Here is where we get into the episodes I saw as a kid on the Sci-Fi channel back when Sci-Fi was good. Uh, I miss the old sci-fi Twilight Zone, Tales from the Crypt, yes, Star Trek, I am a Trekkie. Mm. Anyways, let's get through this one. November 30th, 1994. Uh, I was only a year old when this episode came out. Uh, starring Mark Tukoskos. Ooh, uh... Rainbow Wrath for Life might like this episode. Uh, it stars Deb Dunning, Marjian Holden, Stoney Jackson, and Wayne Newton. Uh, screenplay by John Harrison and directed by John Harrison. Pretty much this is a boxing uh, episode. But it starts off like a Christmas episode, like... Uh, the Crypt Keeper is uh, dressed from head to toe in a Santa outfit. Kind of like in the very first episode uh, of the series. He's dressed up in a Santa outfit. And he decides he's going to tell a story about nagging wives uh who work in the boxing tournaments. Uh, they're both boxers. And. Pretty much all it's about is boxing. And. The husbands of the wives. End up saying. We've had enough of you two bickering constantly. And. They make a bet, well, they make a deal, uh, the two husbands make a deal with each other to get their wives killed in the ring. So, this one has a, uh, I don't want to call it a happy ending, but I don't want to call it a bad ending either. Like, I can see myself watching this episode every couple of months. Almost wrapped the DVD there. So, I'm going to make that uh, one, I'm going to make that description short. 
Then we get to the first episode I ever saw of Tales from the Crypt. The Assassin. This one gives a new meaning to transgendered uh, females. I don't mind transgendered females either. Hey, you are who you are just as long as you're happy with yourself, that's all that matters. But, anyways, this one's about a housewife uh, who spies, well, not spies, but assassins end up coming in, destroying her house, all trying to find her husband. And here's who we got as the... Hmm assassins there's four assassins and they are chelsea field jonathan banks marshall teague and corey feldman i honestly have never heard of any of these people other than corey feldman mm. it's directed by scott Nim nimmerfro and directed by martin von hazelberg and this episode came out December 7th, 1994. So, they keep on interrogating this uh, housewife. Oh, uh, we know your husband is uh, the assassin we've been looking for. And they say they found uh, the address, uh, found out the whereabouts of this guy by his dental work so they go through this whole house looking for him and the wife keeps saying this is my husband right here Jeremy McKay uh, and a cat fighting shoes and stuff gets thrown and a uh, girl on girl fighting and I'm like yeah do your thing, girl. <laughs> and what happens is uh, she gets put into the basement and Corey Feldman ends up coming down to shoot her. And she ends up going on the treadmill, puts her legs on one leg on one side of the uh treadmill and then the other leg on the other side of the treadmill and she pretty much presents herself uh, to Corey Feldman and Corey Feldman like an idiot ends up deciding oh well, I'm gonna get some tonight and so he ends up trying to get it on with the woman and she uh, makes the treadmill go faster and what happens is Corey Feldman hits his head and his necktie ends up going through the gears of the treadmill and chokes him to death snaps his neck and I'm like ooh shit that's a way to go and what happens next she ends up taking her heel high heels off and bashes uh, the other guy into other guy in the eye. And my bad, there's not five uh, assassins out looking for this assassin, pretty much. And then we get to the cat fight continued. And so. There's a fighting and chewing, and then there's a twist in this story, and I won't spoil it, so I'm going to stop talking about this episode right now. But this one has a happy ending, so we've got some happy endings in this season. <laughs> happy ending. I uh, gotta love it. Uh, Stared in Horror. Uh, this is my favorite episode, and... Since I have the books out, 
I planned this review. Gotta find the issue. Okay. Stand in horror. Let's open this puppy up. Okay. What story is it? Stared in horror. It's the last story. Okay, the witch's cauldron. Well, the fire's lit under my cauldron. I'm reading uh, the opening for this. Under my cauldron again. So coming to the haunt of fear. Yep, it's me, the old witch, ready to dish out another of my crazy concoctions of cadaverous compoundings. Dealing with dismal delvings into the depressive. Everybody ready? Good. Then I'll begin the mad morsel of morbidity I call stared in horror. Pretty much this story I read it once. It's about this man named Clive. Clyde I mean. Who is a criminal he ends up running away uh, to uh, this house and this is the episode I'm talking about by the way and it's got Arlie Ermey in it in a small room uh, what happens is he ends up running into this old house and he's greeted by this old lady and she looks like she's about to die at any second not any moment but any second she could die and what happens is uh, she's got a granddaughter uh, living upstairs so the the guy by the name of Clyde ends up trying to get himself some and slowly but surely weird things start happening uh, the young girl is nowhere to be found the granddaughter I mean is nowhere to be found and then the old lady pops up out of nowhere and so on uh, then you find out there's a curse put on the stairs whoever is an outsider when they go up they get older but when they go down they stay the same age like the normal age they are but when the old lady goes up the stairs she's young and so, Clyde ends up deciding, uh, you know what, I think I'm going to stay uh, on this step of stairs. And the old lady, who is actually the granddaughter, I'm not spoiling anything, even though it sounds that way, I'm not spoiling anything. Uh, she ends up deciding to stay on the stairs too but there's a twist ending to this one and it's a happy ending so we've got a couple of happy endings in this season now we get to in the groove this episode I didn't really care much for I didn't give it two fucks whatsoever but here we go this one is about a guy working at a, a radio station for sex talk. Like, fulfill your fantasies by, uh, pretty much. It's like phone sex, but radio sex. Uh, and this guy uh, and new co-host end up deciding 
you know what would be cool? Killing a person on radio. So they decide to take out uh, the guy's sister because she's owner and proprietor of this radio station. And what happens is all that doesn't go as planned and we get another bad ending. And you'll see how it's a bad ending when you see the episode. So, sorry I'm cutting some of these short, but uh, even though I do have unlimited time for this thing, uh, I'm going to just whiz through some of these. Now we get to my second favorite episode, Surprise Party. Uh, who we do we've got on uh, this episode starring Adam Stark, Claire Hoke, Jake Busey, a oh, big name right there. Uh, he also played in The Frighteners as the villain, as always. And Rance Howard, never heard of him or her. Screenplay by Tom Lanes and Coleman Decay. Directed by Elliot Silverstein. Pretty much this is about a guy who, he's pretty much a vulture. Not, not like an actual vulture, but have you ever heard the term vulture, you know? Uh, when somebody dies in the rich family, uh, they think they're going to get all of this money from this person's death. Well, that's what this guy is. He... He doesn't care about his father whatsoever, and he decides he's going to kill his father, all in order to get money. But the father didn't put uh, the guy in the world, and there's, there's a reason behind it, uh, and pretty much the only reward anybody's going to get if you can call it a reward, is an old house. What happens is, all this guy wants is money and this particular house. What's so special about this house? A fire broke out uh, many years ago, and the only one still alive was this guy's father. So, he goes and ends up uh, pretty much killing his father. And the guy goes to the house expecting just a great big uh, thing, but a surprise party happens for him. And... They all seem really nice, and even Jake Busey seems pretty nice for a little bit. Then he turns into an asshole, like, in most of the roles he is. He's trying to be like his father, Gary Busey. But I don't, I don't mind Jake Busey uh, as an actor. I think he's a pretty good actor. Granted, he's no Hitcher, even though he played in the Hitcher, too. Uh... But anyways, what can I say about this episode? I enjoyed it. Uh, I'm sure people out there who have never seen Tales from the Crypt will enjoy the episode. Then we get to the Doctor of Horror. Travis Tritt and Ben Stein and Hank Azaria, three stars, playing in this episode. And a guy named Austin Pendleton. Uh, screenplay by Larry Wilson, directed by Larry Wilson, yada, yada, yada. Uh, this one's about a mad doctor uh, who steals corpses from morgues and whatever, trying to find the soul. He's trying to own a soul so he can have the body do its, do his bidding. 
and he ends up bribing these two uh, new guards uh, of the morgue and they go on a killing spree, killing people, uh, killing Ben Stein uh, in order to find a soul. But the, the doctor ends up finding out, oh, uh, if you kill the person, the soul just disappears. So they decide to get a live person. And it just so happened to be poor Travis Tritt. I'll show it off. That's what happens when you try to own a soul of pity. Bad things. This episode was great. I really, really, really enjoyed it. And if you're a Tales from the Crypt fan, you've already probably already seen this episode. And hell, you guys probably already have this on DVD. Then we get to Comes the Dawn. This one we've got pretty much one person I've heard of, Michael Ironside, and then we've got a woman by the name of Vivian Wu, and a guy by the name of Bruce Payne. It takes place in Alaska, and Michael Ironside is hunting for something. I forget if it's gold or certain bears or whatever. I could be wrong, but uh, Vivian Wu plays pretty much a soldier, uh, like she used to be a soldier, she used to be a cadet, whatever, and she decides to actually help. Michael Ironside, but there's a thing going on involving vampires. Ooh. I think this is where the writer of 30 Days of Night got his idea from this episode. Uh, sadly, it doesn't have a picture of the episode, so I can't say anything. Uh, this episode the vampires look great and this one has a good ending too so this season has some episodes with good endings and there's only three episodes on this three by the way might as well show off the discs one another okay. this play ball you are guilty. Okay. Comes the Dawn is a great one to watch on Halloween. How most of these episodes are great to watch on Halloween. Now we get to one of my favorites. And I bit my tongue. 99 and 44 over 100% pure horror. This one uh, stars Bruce Davison, Christy Conway, Darren Heems, Kelly Caulfield, and Ricky Dean Logan. And here's a cool thing. Screenplay by Rodman Flunder, directed by Rodman Flunder. This is a guy who directed uh, Leprechaun 3 and 4. Yeah, I know there's a lot of people who hate Leprechaun, but I like it. I hate the fourth one, but I like the series. And he also wrote and directed, I think wrote and directed, the movie Idle Hands with Devon Sawa. Uh, but, anyways, getting on point for this episode, uh, it's about this woman who's cheating on her husband, a real low down conniving bitch. Uh, She's cheating on her poor husband, who has no clue. Uh, and the guy works at a soap uh, processing plant, and the wife does the artwork for the packaging. 
and her uh, artwork is considered too suggestive to be put out on store shelves. So the husband hires a new artist played by Ricky Dean Logan and we only see Ricky Dean Logan in one scene and that's it. And for those who don't know who he is, he played Carlos in uh, Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare. You know, the kid who was deaf and got his earlobe cut off and got the Q-tip shoved through his head. Well, he's here uh, in this episode. Not for very long, though. And... Anyways, I got this uh, story on uh, the books, too, and it's actually in this same issue. I only read each of the stories once, but I can see myself rereading the stories. Anyways. The bitch decides she's going to kill her husband. And how she does that, she ends up, I think, shooting him and then pushing his body into the toxic stuff that makes the soap. Well, not really toxic, but burning uh, stuff that makes the soap. And there's a thing that he says that is a uh, foreshadowing what happens in the ending. He says, most soaps use a uh, stuff of acid in order to uh, clean you, and that's just like if you took stomach acid from yourself and decided you were going to wash uh, yourself with that. And that's a cool, pretty much foreshadowing of what's to come. And the bitch decides, oh, she's going to take this self home. That she killed her husband, and pretty much he is soap now. And yeah, that sounds weird, but come on, it's Tales from the Crypt. You probably heard of stuff that's weirder than this. Uh, anyways, I thought the episode was really good. Now we get to You Murder. This is a really creative episode. It's done through first person entirely. And it's got Humphrey Bogart, John Lithgow, Isabella Rosalini, Sherry Lynn Finn, and Robert Satchin. Screenplay by A.L. Katz and Gilbert Adler. Directed by Robert Zemeckis and original air date January 25th, 1995. And holy shit, it's been an hour. <laughs> Time flies when you're talking about Tales from the Crypt. This is probably my longest episode, too. Uh, this one is all done through first person, and we're looking through the eyes of Humphrey Bogart. He's dead, but yet we're hearing what's going on in his mind. How so is beyond me when he's dead as a doornail. And he... He wants revenge on the two people who killed him, Isabella Rosalini and uh, John Lithgow. They were having a relationship uh, behind Humphrey Bogart's back. Uh, Isabella Rosalini was pretty much his woman, but she was cheating on him with John Lithgow, which, how can you go and dump Humphrey Bogart for John Lithgow. I like John Lithgow as an actor, and I like Humphrey Bogart as an actor. Isabella Rosalini did what she could. Uh, and 
How can you dump Humphrey Bogart? He's the man with the plan. He's played in so many damn movies, it's hard to keep count. Granted, I don't remember the titles of the movies, but... I know him. He's, he's a good actor. I mean, I don't know him personally, but... I know of him. He's he's a pretty good, decent actor. I like him. But anyways, is this episode worth watching? Yeah, because it's trying something new. Not new by today's standards, but new within the 90s. And there is only one special feature, Whirlpool Virtual Comic Book. But anyways, what do I give Season 6 of Tales from the Crypt? I give it a 9 out of 10 because it's got a hell of a lot of good episodes on it. Some weird, some odd, some not really all that entertaining, but 9 out of 10. Loved it. And it was one of the best birthday presents I ever got. I love Tales from the Crypt, always have, always will, and if you can believe it, I got these issues for 50 cents. That's not bad when you think about it, even for reissues, that's still a pretty damn good price, come on, 50 cents for a comic book, why not? I must have spent like $3 total for each of these issues, like not each, but altogether three dollars. But anyways, uh, this episode went on too long. Uh, hopefully you all stuck around and stood through my rambling of how great uh, Tales from the Crypt is. I love Tales from the Crypt and like I said, I always will. So anyways, catch you tomorrow for the Halloween reviews. So hopefully you all out there are having a safe October. And Devil's Night is coming up, so hopefully none of you kids are out there drinking, partying, doing drugs, having unprotected sex. Don't be doing that stuff because you might end up with a disease or whatever what you do is your business anyways but anyways uh hopefully you all enjoyed my review over tales from the crypt season six so peace hopefully you all enjoyed